its speaker in the uh, continuing ongoing UVA Department of Radiology and Medical Imaging keynote lecture series. We started this as a type of a grand rounds and outreach or international outreach uh, just around the time of uh, COVID. And we continue having uh, exciting and interesting speakers. You can see many topics covered on the UVA faculty development, uh, career development website with a lot of our lectures. And uh, we are bringing back one of our more popular speakers tonight. We're kind enough to have her back, uh, Jennifer Kim Penberthy, a renowned professor, the Chester Carlson Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at UVA. She also has an appointment at the UVA Cancer Center. She has uh, published uh, a, a book recently on living mindfully across lifespan, an intergenerational guide, came out in 2020. She's the Association Director for Clinical Wellness at the UVA School of Medicine. She's a fellow of the Society of Clinical Psychology, and she has a number of leadership positions, including the past president of the International CBASP Society, the former chair of the Society of Clinical Psychology Diversity Committee. She's a fellow of the APA Leadership Committee. I could spend half of her lecture uh, with her accolades, but maybe we ought to turn to the topic of tonight, which is speaking to moral injury. And you might kind of wonder why, what, what is this? We're going to get into all that, but... Uh, um, you know, when I try to think about this in a short summary, it's that discrepancy between what you feel like you ought to be able to do because of our 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 career, our moral drive, the reason we've gone into healthcare, and what we're able to do given the situational uh, constraints, limits, external, internal, otherwise um, that we face. Um, Kim, how would you um, introduce the topic or some examples that we're facing in healthcare? Yes. So the terminology is interesting because we often know what we're feeling and, and we may not really have um, a way to sort of place it in this continuum. When we think of moral distress, many of us understand this as, as a reaction to um, a, a um, an event where our our moral standards might be violated or challenged. Uh, maybe we interact in a situation where we feel um, that something uh, was not done um, ethically, morally, or we witness this, or we're asked to even do it. Um, and healthcare is going to have this. It's it's it. We we suffered with this prior to to the pandemic to COVID. And, and it's ongoing, it's really going to happen in any high intensity work environment. And certainly in a work environment where there are life and death choices being made. Um, moral injury is when the distress is, is much more um, prevalent. So it is more of the persisting distress um, that we see lead to injurious behavior. And, and we're going to talk about sort of unpacking what this looks like, but really it's this exposure to morally threatening situations where that accumulates over time. Yeah, this is very different than burnout. And I know that you're going to help us understand why that's different. And of course, our lecture tonight is coming out of the UVA radiology and medical imaging department, although we're going to speak about issues that are far, far larger and beyond radiology. But for those diagnostic, for example, radiologists, you might wonder, how might I experience this? And a very simple example of that would be that you have stacks and stacks of um, studies to read, and we're wired to accomplish and review these things in, in, a, in a timely and detailed um, and comprehensive fashion, because that's why we do this for a living. We know what that means in terms of managing um, uh, oncologic uh, decisions for otherwise, and just the situation that we're struggling with, perhaps with staff shortages, doesn't let us do the job that we need to do. And that creates that same injury, even in a purely diagnostic uh, specialty like ours. Um, what do you say we get started? Certainly, certainly. Mine's are yours. I will. Uh, well, I and 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 I I have to say again, I completely agree that this is applicable to anyone working in in this field in healthcare. Um, and I will begin sharing my slides right now. So uh, we've introduced the topic 
and we'll be just getting into it again, part of the keynote lecture series. I want to say thank you so much for the honor being able to speak to all of you. And my disclosures, uh, as, as Ziv said, I, I do have a role at the university doing this and lecture um, um, worldwide and do get paid for those often. I have uh, no other conflicts to uh, list. The learning objectives for tonight are really about moral injury, describing it in healthcare. And as uh, Dr. Haskell said, differentiating it from moral distress and from burnout. And we might even talk a little bit about how it's different from something like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Explore the causes and um, including, very importantly, the system uh, factors, systemic factors, the institutional factors, um, because that is an important component of the moral injury versus burnout and identifying um, strategies to help address this and support our clinicians. So as I had mentioned, an introduction um, to the moral distress, that's more of the short-term response to what we would call potentially morally injurious events. So these are potentially moral injurious behaviors or events the reason we have potential listed there is because you also have to remember we're each individual people. So we have our unique experiences, our unique set of beliefs. And um, so what may be um, uh, distressing to me morally may not be to someone else. And there's not necessarily a right or wrong unless you're talking about some extreme um, life or death situation. Um, so when we think of this, it's it's typically going to be also based on the individual and um, their approach to this. So the moral injury refers specifically to that persisting distress that might occur after ongoing exposure to these events. And you have to keep in mind, um, it is um, in the literature really assumed that these potentially injurious events are fairly rare. So we're not talking about the day-to-day -day drudgery um, that we might encounter that certainly can lead to burnout. We are talking really about these big ones that are out of a person's control, have very negative effects on your personal integrity or meaning making. So these um, are, are really fairly strong and we hope, you know, relatively rare, although I say relative, so we have to keep you know individuals in mind, and of course, different specialties are exposed to different levels. The residue is what we're talking about: moral residue when you're repeatedly exposed to these situations. Um, it's like a cumulative traumatization, and it's important to remember these um, potentially moral injurious events can happen at an individual level in a team or at a organizational or system level. Um, and they are um, associated with burnout. They're not exactly the same thing. And we will talk a little bit about that. So as they've pointed out, these um, the, the literature really started um, with military veterans. So moral injury is a term used in military veteran literature to define a wound that results from doing something that violates one's own ethics, ideals, or attachments. And it was introduced um, by the Veterans Affairs psychiatrist, uh, Jonathan Shea, who um, described it really as an experience that was not adequately captured by PTSD. So PTSD typically is thought of as originating from a frightening or dangerous event that was witnessed. And, and what we're talking about with a moral injury is different. So it's identified as a psychological trauma resulting from betrayal of what is morally correct to the individual by someone who holds legitimate authority in a high stakes situation. So obviously you see this in, in these high intensity work environments like the military um, and healthcare. So the perpetrator of moral wrong is, is typically an authority figure, but the injury is inflicted on a subordinate. Um, so so the, the moral injury could be 
inflicted by an institution or a system or a, um, that sort of environment as well. The definition was expanded later um, to define moral injury and, and include the lasting psychological, biological, spiritual, behavioral, and social impact of perpetrating, failing to prevent, or bearing witness to acts that transgress our moral beliefs and expectations. So it, it was the, taken not to just be witnessing other people doing this to us, authority figures doing things harmful to us um, that were violating our morals, but also um, participating in that as well. So accordingly, the moral injury can result from both commission and omission. So it can be something we do or something we fail to do that um, violates our ethics. And um, the, the big injury here is really this rupture in our self-identity. So it that's what leads to these feelings of guilt and shame. Um, it's, again, an injury of healthcare is not the same as all injury in war where you might be killing somebody, um, but it is being unable to provide the high quality care and the healing in the context of healthcare that we all signed up to do. So um, the way this is thought of as being related to burnout is um, that the stress injury, the moral injury is one of the addition, one of the multiple stressors that over time can accumulate. And if it's not addressed, can then lead to burnout. And again, we see the four sources of our stress, typically in healthcare, the wear and tear that we had talked about, um, just the accumulation of stress from all sources um, without recovery, uh, traumatic injury. So um, experiencing death provoking terror, this can also lead to some post-traumatic stress, grief injuries, so loss of people, and then of course, moral injuries. So um, that's what we're talking about today, these moral injuries. And as I said, it's defined in healthcare as not the offense of killing another human in the context of war, but really being unable to care, to do what we took an oath to do is put the patient first. So I'm sure many of you reflecting over your past career, your current work can think of examples of either moral distress um, and or moral injury. Um, so here's some that I've heard of uh, from, from people I work with um, that were um, true uh, experiences that people had real moral conflict over. So continuing life support, even though it's not in the best interest of the patient, according to the, the clinician, um, inadequate communication about end of life care, we have a big problem with talking about death and um, many people that leads to some moral distress and moral injuries. Um, what people perceive of as inappropriate use of healthcare resources. Inadequate staffing is another big one. So um, people that um, are inadequately trained or, or just not having anyone at all can uh, really strike a chord um, ethically and, and make us feel very uncomfortable. Inadequate pain relief to provide to patients. Um, this has become increasingly problematic with um, the changes in our practices with um, different kinds of pain medications. And I hear from both sides, uh, patients and physicians about how distressing this is and giving false hope to patients and families, um, especially witnessing this um, provided to someone where you feel that it's, um, it's just really morally reprehensible. And I've heard that from people as well. So again, these are just some examples. I would encourage you to think about your own practice. And um, if you had these um, in your experiences, if they're still happening um, and what impact they're having on you. Um, and, and again, we have some specific terminology and 
it it can be helpful to sort of conceptualize what's going on. I think what's most important is really your own personal experience and the symptoms you're having. We're going to speak about that here in a little bit. Um, to give us some context, however, I think looking at this sort of progression that I've been referring to from moral distress, um, which is defined as the psychological distress of being in a situation where you're constrained from acting on what you know to be right. Um, so that's distressing. And, and it often causes some unease, frustration, you might feel powerless, you might even have some physiological responses like palpitations. It's usually acute, however, it's usually a short term thing that's resolved one way or the other. Um, to repair this really, um, again, removing the inciting situation, so maybe it gets resolved, the patient gets seen, something happens. Um, Honestly, to do deeper work on this, it's going to take systems reform, um, strengthening uh, your moral identity through the community, cultivating moral resilience. So both working on the individual and the system and the potential consequences of a moral distress of these ongoing is a more leading to a moral injury. And then the moral injury is more lasting. So it's a lasting psychological or spiritual or behavioral uh, impact and and this can be again um, demonstrated through symptoms of guilt or shame, anger. And we'll talk a little bit about those specifically. What might link to what kind of injury? This is more chronic and definitely is related to um, institutional level structural reform that's uh, needed. Typically, uh, a moral injury is is not solely on the back of the individual provider. It really is um, usually harbored within a larger system issue and can lead to burnout. And then of burnout, of course, most people have heard of this term. This is more of a syndrome. Um, it's not a diagnostic category. None of these are, none of them are in the DSM. Um, they're really um, more related to uh, something similar to a work injury at um, at the hospital. So uh, I think trying to think of this similar to instead of a um, an on the job injury from from you know lifting a patient where you hurt your back, this is really an on the job injury from having to um, interact with a system that is doing things that violate your morals. And that's one way to think about it. Um, and again, the burnout is like the most severe form of this where it's chronic and you may need um, much more um, intensive interventions to sort of address that. And of course, burnout can lead to even bigger problems like um, errors that can lead to malpractice or uh, dissatisfied patients. So we can assess moral injury um, and there is some controversy about this, to be honest. Um, although there are objective, easy to administer skills, uh, scales um, to sort of help quantify this when we do our research, um, the risk of, of sort of quantifying it like in a, in a psychological measure is that we pathologize it. And it really should not be considered a disorder because if you think about it, it's a, an appropriate response to a problem in the environment typically, or a problem in the system. So I will give that caveat when we talk about this assessment tool. Um, and really the locus of pathology, if, if we're going to call it that, is, is the circumstances that give rise to this. So again, thinking about it's a, it's a sick system, not a sick person. And this is why when we talk about individuals, we can talk about building resilience, perhaps, um, improving maybe communication, self-care, but something like just saying, we'll go do some yoga or mindfulness or just chill out is not really going to address it because the moral injury is happening because of the uh, circumstances in the environment. So really, the context-driven problem of moral injury requires a context-based uh, solution, which means the system has to change. With that caveat, 
I will share with you um, the most used um, moral injury scale, which is um, the moral injury symptom scale for health professionals. And you can take a look at this yourself here. The way this is uh, administered and scored is each of the 10 questions is um, assessed on a Likert scale from one that you strongly disagree with the statement to 10 you strongly agree you simply add them up and you also um, inquire about, is this impacting your functioning? So you're going to, uh, question 11 is, um, is asked that says, you know, does this cause distress and, and interfere with your functioning? And what um, we have found in the literature is, is, a score of 36 or higher. Now, remember, you can have um, the highest scores 100. So even just 36 um, and above had about a 93 um, specificity rate, a 93% specificity for identifying a moral injury um, that was causing moderate to extreme problems. And it was about 84% sensitive. So pretty sensitive and specific. Um, and Again, if you're interested in using this, you know, it's quite easy. The risk uh, that you want to really protect against is, is blaming the person taking this. This is their reaction to an environmental situation, and that's important to remember. And along those lines, um, another tool that has been used and researched is this, this wheel of um, of moral injury. So it's a moral injury experience real wheel. So the idea here um, that was was used and studied was that educating people more about the specific kinds of moral injuries and their associated um, resultant symptoms or or reaction can help people um, really uh, identify what's going on because many healthcare professionals are working, 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 and may then suddenly have one of these um, symptoms or feel this certain way um, and not understand where it's coming from. And so this helps attach it back to the environment, to what's going on. And I'll just briefly go over this because I do think this is fascinating and and the research has shown that even just becoming more aware of this, being more familiar with it, helped um, increase moral emotional awareness and um, build some resilience in people. So in that first upper left quadrant where it's sort of an orange and, and um, colors, that one is, is focused on acts of betrayal of others. So this is often exactly what we think of when we think of a moral injury someone has the authority has betrayed me um so this often is associated with anger feelings and so you'll see it an array there on the edge of of different feelings that are all sort of have this core of anger rage feeling vengeful resentful contempt disillusioned or mistrustful um helpless these are where we we may feel those emotions before we really understand what's coming, uh, where it's coming from. And it, it could be coming from a moral injury that is betrayal by our authority figures. Um, the the another, another one in the green, just below that, these are where we witness acts of others that violate our moral code. So these are um, witnessing excessive violence, death, immoral acts when we see this happening in our system. And the, the broader emotion associated with this is disgust. Uh, so you can see, again, there's overlap in all of these, but this helps you orient, like if I'm feeling sick, nauseated, revolted, what, what is that linked to? That's often um, this disgust related to again, experiences that are disgusting in the environment and it's an appropriate response to a maladaptive situation. The third is acts of personal transgression. So this is where I might've done something that was reprehensible to me. 
Maybe I was directed to do it. Maybe I felt forced to do it. And that leads um, to the guilt and shame. So you may identify if I'm feeling this, I'm feeling remorse, regret. What might that be related to? My own sense of transgression. And then the fourth and final is, is this feeling of uh, discrepant events with the worldview. So these are the unavoidable, irresolvable moral conflict. This is where I, I see this is not right and I can't do anything about it. Um, this can be in our, in our larger environment, in our own institution, that sort of thing. So that feeling, if you have sense of feeling disoriented, this sort of disillusionment, feeling apathetic, this could be from um, a moral injury in this realm, the yellow realm. And, and the reason, again, that this is important to think about is because when we have a moral injury, we are going to have a, typically a presentation with some, some sort of symptom that is not very positive. So anger, um, shame, uh, you'll see here other ways that moral injury presents itself. You may have depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, insomnia, um, grief, you feel alienated. I know I've, I've spoken with so many physicians who say, I just want to slip in the hospital, do my work and leave. I just don't want to see anyone. I don't want to deal with it. Um, and it's from a moral injury of, of maybe feeling betrayed by um, other, other healthcare providers or the system. And um, so again, this awareness that this is an, a response to things going on in our environment and that it needs to be addressed because it can lead to burnout and worse things. And the prevalence is not insignificant. So this is data from, sorry, I had the reference on there, it dropped off, but um, this is data from um, the, the pandemic and frontline workers. So these were um, um, you know, people like yourselves and others that were working um, during this time and they did these assessments of um, moral injury, and you see 32% in the US, in China and Israel, 41%, um, I'm sure it is significantly higher um, at this point in time. Um, and we all need to keep that in mind. We're all sort of impacted by the events all over the world. So again, we've talked about um, this is uh, caused by the events in, in, in and around us. So other, the system, other people, um, and even our own behaviors. And I'm not going to read you all of these. Um, you'll have the slides and be able to review this, but really we look at three areas where we know moral injuries can emanate from. Um, the biggest one by far is the systemic factors. So um, things like the healthcare system being overloaded, overcrowded, um, resource allocation, uh, having to decide about that. And um, Ziv sort of touched on these things, too much work and, and not enough time, not enough resources, not enough people. Um, of course, you can look through here, insurance limitations, regulatory pressures, um, discrepancies in conflicts in in you know different leadership uh so we might have colleagues in a different division uh who have a different agenda and we lead we lead to some moral um injuries that way other public policies that um are perceived as unjust or not equitable and of course the limitations in technology and and education gaps the culture also is another big one. Um, and Ziv and I were speaking about that. You know, it really is important to have a culture uh, in, in the leadership and beyond that weaves into it this um, awareness of, of moral injury and protections for it. So mitigating against it early on and certainly addressing it once, um, once it has happened. So some strategies the organization can take into account to help address this are promoting a, a healthy work environment. So a culture that supports this balance for us, prevents uh, overload in our work, fostering open communication. So a place where we feel safe enough to um, discuss these dilemmas that we have, to see um, 
if we can correct some of them without fear of retribution, providing ethical training. We we have um, an abundance of this at UVA, in, in, in my opinion, more than many other hospitals where we can get training in ethics, we can get ethical consults, we can get uh, moral injury, uh, moral distress consults. Um, so, and, and, and the need is that we, we need to provide um, a, a safe environment where people can access that and, and the leadership sees the value in that. And implementing fair policies that are ethically sound and aligned with the values um, and, and having that done, you know, collectively by people and not dictated by higher ups. Allocating resources equitably and having a transparent decision making also help address this from the environment side. Um, some other things, you know, that can help that research has actually demonstrated are doing things like implementing um, healthcare record optimization. We have that here at UVA. You can get a consult and someone can help you with EPIC um, if that's something that's really uh, bothering you. Reducing administrative burden. There's been research to show that that can burn, prevent burnout, um, not, just, not just moral injury, but burnout. And of course, providing team-based care, increasing effective communication, reducing work hours. These all are things that, that are needed to be done by the system, by the organization. So um, they've been shown to be effective in a team. If you're a team leader, there are things you can do to help address moral injury. Um, really actively work on the team dynamics. Moral injuries ab above and beyond burnout really are something that we are all responsible to each other for helping prevent and address. So just like when we go to war, we have to depend on other people to help uh, help us through that, to help us if we witness something that violates our morals. And we, we need to think of it that way in healthcare as well, that we, we need to look out for each other um, not just ourselves. So we we need to if actively try to increase the trust and the support and the cohesion of our team. If we're a leader, um, we can make that one of our goals. If we're a member, we can actively try to behave that way. So trying, again, to improve communication um, because ineffective communication poor trust all all will increase the risk for moral injury. Um, also, we see that team factors like conflicting values and beliefs, hierarchies and power dynamics, poor leadership um, all lead to uh, increased risk for for moral injury. And of course, um, burnout and staff turnover, which were very high um, during COVID absolutely lead to uh, moral injuries. I think in um, in COVID-19, during the first 18 months, nearly 20% of medical workforce left their jobs. I mean, so it's it's a big deal um, and can significantly impact our how we feel. Other factors being um, not clear what your role is, lack of recognition for the work you do, of course, any kind of uh, bullying in the workforce, harassment, um, or perceived work uh, uh, distribution that is not fair, um, and insufficient debriefing, as well as ongoing um, issues with lack of diversity and inclusion, and, and not educating our teams on um, ethical competency. So, it can be really helpful to bring in someone to do some education about that, um, help people do values clarification, um, identify sort of a moral code for your group. All of these things can be helpful in team-based ways to address moral injury and prevent and mitigate it. Um, so doing the team building, collaborating interdisciplinary, um, so you're getting other people's point of view that are working on the same team, debriefing, oh, that's so important after critical incidents. Um, I think we do a pretty good job of that, uh, but sometimes it slips by and it can lead to a moral injury. And of course, peer support. This is the whole thing of looking out for each other, having a buddy 
We have a peer support program at UVA, if you're not aware, it's run through the Wisdom and Wellbeing program. Um, so there are people out there that can help you um, and, and that can help mitigate some of uh, the moral distress that we see. It can help build a positive work environment, which has been shown to reduce um, moral injury and burnout. And of course, improving the work-life balance, having supportive leadership, all we have evidence to show that they help. One strategy we, we actively teach at UVA is really focused on um, helping people remember how to connect, how to be that, that, that person who's looking out um, for your colleague. So understanding what a moral injury might look like on a person is important because as we said, remember that wheel it had a lot of these behaviors and emotions that we may see in our colleagues that we may erroneously um, sort of think um, are related to that individual uh, as, as sort of a, a characteristic, like, oh, uh, this man is coming in, my, my colleague's coming in and being very grumpy and, 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 and short with me. And I think he's just a jerk. And really I can think of it instead of that is a symptom of a moral injury. And I wonder what happened. I mean, so can I check in with him? He seems not himself. He seems much more stressed and distressed than I know him to be typically. So this is a strategy to connect with someone to say, I'm gonna notice if someone is behaving in that way, one of those uh, ways that we saw on that wheel. And I'm gonna ask about it. I'm just gonna approach and ask about it instead of assuming that they're just a, a, a bad person. And I'm gonna let them know that I wanna help. I'm gonna inquire, what's up? Everything okay? You know, what's going on? And then listen, I'm gonna listen. And if I feel like I have something to respond, I can, I can provide support. I can say, I'm here to listen, that's, that's really tough. Or, you know, do you, do you want me to share some resources I have? That sort of thing. So it's getting back to that being a, a, a true teammate, um, a colleague who can reach out and um, check in with someone because we're going to try to increasingly recognize those symptoms as a, a potentially a moral injury that, um, or even moral distress that that I need to address because I'm also responsible for my teammates. I need to see it in myself and I need to see it in others and help them and connect. And then finally, we have our own responsibility to ourselves. So we know that there are individual factors that um, can lead to a more likelihood of a moral injury. So if I have a strong personal belief system um, and that's violated, if I don't have good resilience um, and, and coping mechanisms, um, that's going to put me at risk. If I have a history of personal trauma, that's going to put me at risk. Uh, so all of these things I need to sort of know about myself. If I'm not very emotionally intelligent, that means I'm, I'm not really able to read my own emotions and manage them or read other people's emotions and manage them. That's going to make it uh, more likely that I'm at risk for a moral injury. So um, understanding some of these individual factors can help. And one that I see a lot is the last one, this professional identity, um, especially in our, our older, more mature physicians who may be transitioning out of work. Um, that can be a very, very challenging uh, conflict when um, your professional identity is threatened. Your belief in your ability to affect change is called your self-efficacy. If that is damaged, it can lead to moral injury. If you, if you are already burned out, it can make you more vulnerable. And of course, if you are um, not experienced, you don't, uh, you haven't sort of been through uh, the wars, so to speak, you are going to be at, at higher risk. So um, again, some of these, I won't read all of them to you, but looking through these and recognizing that, um, you know, if I have other stressors, 
outside of work, this compounds the effect of stress and may increase my risk for moral injury. Each of these things, if I'm perfectionistic, overly conscientious, um, or, or even what we might think of as neurotic, that can influence how you um, process moral distress and can lead to higher rates of injury. So strategies to address this. Um, your, your group is wonderful. I mean, you've done work on resilience. So training in resilience individually can help. Again, we're not saying this is the clinician's sole responsibility. It is partly uh, on the physician to be um, the most effective they can be, to be practicing self-care. So that might mean mental health support, self-care education, about why this is important in managing stress. It might mean a mentorship program. I'm not sure if you all have that or not. Many departments do have more formal mentorships. So really including that in that mentoring, um, not just content knowledge, also how to handle these things, um, how to sort of process them, what to do to sort of work through them. And of course, we don't want to totally discount mindfulness, stress reduction, yoga, running, um, playing golf. All of those things help reduce your stress. Anything that's going to help um, really uh, renew and 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 strengthen your own self identity and and your wellness is going to help you come back to deal again with what is more of a systemic issue versus your own personal issue. So that process of adapting in the face of adversity is resilience. And I always like to remind people, you can't build resilience without stress. So you can think about the distress you feel as a way to build resilience. Promoting safety, checking in with yourself are um, ways to really build that resilience so that then you can be strong enough to help someone else. Um, it's a lot like the saying they have on the airplane, you have to put your own oxygen mask on first. You have to be in a good place to help others. This is the four square breathing that I teach everybody because it's so effective in promoting safety and calmness. It's uh, practiced by the Navy SEALs, and I think now it's caught on to other elite military uh, organizations. So I figure if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. Um, and it is literally um, called box breathing because you can visualize this box and um, you can use whatever sort of time period you want. It's typically done with a four second interval. So you have four seconds of breathing in, four seconds of holding it, four seconds of breathing out and four seconds of holding it. You do this a couple repetitions and um, it does reduce um, that physiological arousal that helps you then sort of move to the next phase. It doesn't solve all your problems, but it, it puts you in a better frame of mind to go on to the next thing, to have that interaction with a stressed out colleague or um, to take the next step in whatever procedure you're doing. And importantly, individually, we have to think about, again, in this moment, what can I control and what is out of my control? We've talked about the fact, and it is very important, that, that moral injury, one of the differences in that topic, in that area, is that we are including the fact that moral injury is really going to be um, a reaction to something in the environment. So a, a normal reaction to something disturbing in the environment. So thinking about, well, what can I control? I can't always control what has happened in the environment, what I have seen um, or witnessed or, or been compelled to do, a choice I've been forced to make. However, I can control myself. I can control what I pay attention to, how I behave, my attitude. Um, and, and that can be very important in helping us regain a sense of our own identity because the moral injury is fundamentally um, a strike at our self-identity. I thought I was a good doctor. I thought I was an ethical person. And what I have just had to do because of the system 
has, has shaken me to the core. That is sort of fundamentally what we're talking about. So anything you can do to um, pause and and be present with that in, in a healthy way, in a clear-headed way is going to be effective. This is another technique that can help as an individual. It sort of combines those things we just spoke about. So the pause for um, a moment when we're confronted with something, taking a breath, again, this helps reduce physiological arousal, observing, observing from that place, that sort of more um, removed, um, more, uh, uh, more sort of distinct area of of perception where we're we're looking at it from the outside to some extent and we're evaluating what what am i feeling what is going on what are my choices um do i have a choice and then proceeding with awareness this can help us really also identify that moral injury where is it coming from what what area on that wheel has um, been violated and again it's it's for the reason of better understanding, being more aware of what's going on and not just being stuck in that feeling where then we can begin to burn out. So I, I'm, I'm wrapping up, I promise. Um, I think it is important to look at this diagram that was made to, to talk about moral injury where really the focus is on these long-term solutions um, and it really will demand a change in, in the business framework of healthcare. So right now we look at the practice of medicine, it is always going to lead to moral dilemmas. I mean, that's un unavoidable. So we know that um, we can address that with uh, ethics consults, with rounds, we have shorts rounds, things like that. We can talk about it, we can process it. And that does help that helps keep it there in that realm of a dilemma or a distressing situation. The problem is when uh, we, we see it continue um, because of this combination of the system and individuals and the teams, and it becomes a moral injury. And um, you know, moral distress is in inevitable because moral dilemmas are inevitable. Moral injuries are not. Um, they, again, are this um, combination of, of the environment and our reaction to it. And so that includes these work conditions that are going to require changes. So they require things like improved staffing, decreased workload, um, more support, equity, um, and, and those will help prevent the moral injuries. Once you have moral injuries, um, if they're not addressed significantly, uh, they do lead to burnout. And we have seen increases across the board in burnout in our healthcare workers. Um, and at that point, you're talking, you really need um, more active sort of programming to address that. So wellness consults, psychological support, and we've been implementing a lot of that at, at UVA um, ever since COVID um, and even before. And hopefully that's helping. Um, but it's important to realize that we have to sort of get back at the root cause as well. And that's through um, changes in, in, in the larger system uh, that are implemented and sustained and informed by, by us, the people working in the system. So all of these things can help reduce moral injury. Um, we can try to mitigate it pre-exposure. So try to foster these supportive environments, um, treat these similar to occupational hazards. So try to prevent them from happening, um, be prepared, and then we can mitigate them after they've happened. So really um, having active um, procedures to deal with these moral injuries. And um, that includes peer support and spiritual guidance. I haven't mentioned that up to this point. However, in the literature, um, chaplains often play a part um, in this, in, especially for people who um, do endorse being spiritual or religious. Um, consults with the chaplaincy programming there can help address um, a moral injury. And I know we are running out of time, so I'm going to end it on that. And um, 
say thank you for your time and attention. And I'm happy to chat in the last couple of minutes we have any questions or issues that you would like to bring up, Ziv. I think, you know, we need leaders in this uh in in this talk as well to speak to this because that's part of um the call to action is really sharing this with our leadership. Kim, I think this has been absolutely wonderful. And um, uh, I'm excited that I'll be able to watch this again because, you know, sometimes this is just a little bit too much all at once. Oh, it is a lot. It is. Um, I I had a a, a couple of thoughts, you know, and that's what we're talking about physicians who are very task focused. It's how we got to these points in our professions. Do Do you have any observations as to whether certain specialties might be more or less at risk or more averse to the concept or educating within their ranks or otherwise, or that's too much of a generalization? I I think that really is too much of a generalization um, because again, I think you have to look at the system in which they're working. So um, I think any system where it is not optimizing patient care, uh, you are at risk for, for moral injury. Any any um, clinic that is understaffed, what whatever the specialty is, is going to put people more at risk. So it's really about looking at the environment and not so much the individuals. Um, so there's not really it's, like- a- it's, it's a double bind. You're gonna take care of the yeah. patient, the hospital, the EMR, the healthcare system, your productivity, right. your insurer. I mean, it, the, the answer should be clear, but it doesn't get to be clear. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you say, these are these are things with broken systems. We don't want to believe that uh, you know that we're working in a broken system. But also, there's the whole aspect of uh, of uh, um, uh, power dynamics and differences in in status. This is if you're an, someone in environmental services, or you're a, a technologist, or you're in a technical role, or you're in a nursing role, then that as then you're exposed to the same types of risks of injury just from a different perspective and may have even less of the ability to recognize it or have systems that provide you support or point you to there. Any any thoughts about how we get more sensitive to those things? Yes, I think you're absolutely right because each each of those things you mentioned is is sort of like a an added risk factor for us, you know. And to me, it's it's twofold. It's really encouraging knowledge of ourselves, uh, awareness of what our own emotions are. That's why I put that wheel up there and, and checking in with ourselves. And very importantly, is really taking ownership to be responsible for our team members, whether they're fellow physicians or nurses or students, and checking in with them. It doesn't hurt to ask, how are you doing? Are you okay? These, are, these aren't natural things that spring from empathy. These are things that have to be trained and identified and that we have to prepare for. Yes. Um, we had we had a, a comment uh, from uh, Professor Matsumoto asking if the increasing in civility towards healthcare providers that um, we're witnessing might also be contributing to um, moral injury that we might see in healthcare. And, you know, how do healthcare systems take this on? Or what's their duty in that? Yeah, I and I, I think that is a very good question, and um, uh, my, uh, you know, my assumption would be that yes, there is, um, because that's another sort of conflict. If you think about our self identity as healers, as as people who help, that then being treated in a way that is um, violating that, that makes us feel like unhelpful people. Um, unworthy people is is a, a, a violation of our of our sort of self identity. So the moral injury, really, that is the heart of it. That I now this is not this is not me. That person that the pa- that patient is complaining about, that's not me. Um, so that's the moral injury. Do you, do you think this is new in the last few decades? And in- Medicine, you know, burnout has been around forever. We just never acknowledged it or recognized it. You know, 30% or more of of sort of U.S. healthcare practitioners have have make the indices for Maslow burnout and probably have for 40 years. Yeah. Is moral injury new or did we just not know how to think about it? I don't. In other words, have systems like the EMR changed it? 
I, I think probably uh, both. I think it's been around, um, like you said, because we've never had a perfect system. Um, and and so again, if you look at, okay, it, it, a lot of this is emanating from the systems. Um, so maybe at some point in time when doctors felt like they had more control over the system, they were the ones designing the system, implementing the system, um, there might have been somewhat less of it. However, it's always been a stressful environment. There's always been life or death decisions to be made. Um, and I think it's been rare, even in the uh, most robust times, that we have access to everything we would really dream of for our patient care. So anytime that those are lacking, we we don't have the resources, um, we we are in an experience where we don't uh, we don't recognize ourselves we're at risk for the moral injury so i think it's both it's probably been there all along and we have more um more ways for it to happen now you know <laughs> you know i'll share i'll share a small personal anecdote in 1986 i worked in a uh, remote uh, healthcare clinic in east africa for many months and um, and I thought that was going to be a career goal, but I struggle with the fact that we had so limited tools, resources, medications to treat certain infections and diagnosis and otherwise that I, I just, I, 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 it, it pained me so much that I made some career changes as a result. And I now realize what that was. And mm -hmm. you've explained it here. And I'm very grateful that you've taken us from system perspective all the way down to trying to open our eyes both to ourselves and to our surroundings as well with this um, fabulous uh, lecture. Uh, Professor 